for the word of God. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But then also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guarding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what uh, was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs of water, groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, uh, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes uh, desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all of my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing uh, was gained under the sun. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can a king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw the wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise man has eyes in his head while the fool walks around in darkness. But I realized that the same fate overtakes both of them. Then I thought in my heart, the faith of the fool will overcome me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said in my heart, this too is meaningless. For the wise man, like the fool, will not be long remembered. In the days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man too must die. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be wise, a wise man or a fool, yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my efforts and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to desire uh, pardon me, despair over all of my toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work uh, with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days, his work is pain and grief. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. A man can do nothing better than to eat, drink, and find satisfaction in his work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to someone who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. In the opening verses uh, of Ecclesiastes, the, the preacher decides he's going to uh, figure everything out. So he decides more, more knowledge, more wisdom will, will do that for him. So he goes to the university and he tries that new approach. Uh, then he goes out into the town and he, he decides that maybe listening to comedians will do it. Uh, or, or buy expensive wine and they sit in the streets and, and they savor the wine under the sun. Live for today. Shrug your shoulders. Be happy. Why worry about life? 
Life is too short not to enjoy it. This is the stuff of refrigerator magnets and bumper stickers, isn't it? And that's the kind of stuff you see. I always wonder about bumper stickers. Who in their right mind actually puts a bumper sticker on a painted bumper anymore? Put them on your back window, okay? You can at least scrape them off when they're not relevant to you any longer. Forget it all. Enjoy yourself and laugh. That's really kind of what he's talking about here. This is, this is you know, he's looking at life and trying to figure this all out. In the summer after uh, I was in second grade, I was playing baseball for the Heronville Eagles. And I was blessed to be able to pitch. And so they put me in as the pitcher, and I was doing pretty good. Right up to the time when that kid hit that line drive straight back at me, and rather than to watch the ball, I turned my head, it hit me in the ear, I was done. But hey, at least I got the pitch. I got to play ball, right? Then later that summer, we moved to a new addition. It was, it was on the outskirts of Oklahoma City. In fact, it was on Southwest 65th Street. We were moving into the country. It wasn't even the city yet. There, uh, there were no services out there. I remember we used to have to gather up all of our trash and, and we put it in the trunk of the car and we would drive about a mile to a big dumpster and put it in the dumpster. I had never seen a dumpster before in my life. That's the first time I had ever seen one. You remember that big old tree that was in the, <coughs> the vacant field on the next street over? It was a huge tree. It was a great big, in fact, we even called it the big tree. I remember how we used to go around, there were some houses being built around there, and, and we would go get those cut off pieces of two by four, and we would pick up all the nails. Back then, Carpenters actually had to drive nails with a hammer. They didn't have pneumatics to do it with. And so there were bent nails everywhere. So we would pick the nails up, we would take them home, and we would pound them back out so they were straight so we could use them. And then we would take it, we would nail those two by fours to the tree to make a ladder so we could get up into it. And we put a cord up there and places to perch, you know, to, just to go out there and really have a good time. Then, then we got out on that great big limb. That thing was probably that big around. And, and we would crawl out on that limb with bed sheets. And we would jump off that limb and, and we would use those bed sheets as parachutes to come back down to the ground. <laughs> that limb must have been 20 feet up there. At least it seemed like it was when I was a kid. And in real reality, it was probably eight feet. But we really thought we were doing something. And then when the wind was blowing really hard, we still had those bed sheets and we would tie all four corners together and then we would go through these houses on the south side of the street where, where the wind would funnel between these two houses. Man, it would be just a, a, a gale blowing through there and we would grab a hold of them sheets and we'd pop them open and it would drag us almost a full block across the grass. It was, oh, it was a ride. <laughs> and we had a good time. We had a marvelous time. Didn't seem like it was very long ago when I was in high school. Remember going to football games? Sitting in the bleachers and cheering on the team. I mean, and of course, my team didn't ever win a game, didn't seem like. But, but we, we had a great time going up there and cheering them on. And, and then basketball season rolled around. I remember sitting on the bench cheering my team on because I wasn't a very good player. You know, it was really good. And, and, and my dad, during the summer, some time back, had, had taken me out to teach me how to play tennis. Uh, well, he taught me how to chase tennis balls, mainly, but, but he taught me how to play tennis. And, and that was good because I actually learned enough that I got on the tennis team. And I lettered. So I, I got a letter jacket for, for being able to play tennis. That was marvelous. And of course, I know you'll find it's hard to believe it. I wasn't very good at doing schoolwork. I didn't do very well with homework. I just didn't excel at that too much. I remember my graduation. We had graduation at the Fairgrounds Arena because my graduating class was so large. The largest in Oklahoma City at the time that they had ever had 747 students. It seemed like ever, forever, just each one person 
going across the stage as, as they would call out your name. And I remember that they finally got down to me, and, and my counselor, Mr. Moore, was the guy calling out names. And I got there to the edge of the stage, and he goes, Ron Percival. Ron Percival? <laughs> Honest, he really did. Man, that year had been so much fun. In fact, that year, uh, I, when I turned 18 in December before I graduated, I went down to the Naval Reserves and I joined the Reserves. It was during the Vietnam War. I didn't want to be drafted, but I didn't want to serve my country. And so I went down and I signed up. Because I wanted to serve, but I wanted to do it my way. I think there's a song about that, right? I mean, my way. So after, uh, after I graduated that summer, they, we went to boot camp at Great Lakes, Illinois. And it was, it was, it was the things that, that you just can, can't even really dream about. And we, we would be marching along, and everybody in my company was a reservist, you know, and, and we're there. We don't have to stay as long as the regular Navy guys. They had 90 days of boot camp, and we, they, they tortured us into having to stay two weeks. And we would be marching along, and, and, and we'd hear these regulars going, Oh, weekend lawyers, yeah, you know, making fun of us. And, of course, our company commander was pretty cool. He'd let us talk back to him. You're not supposed to talk when you're in ranks like that, but he would let us talk back to him, and they would holler out, You know, weekend lawyers, and we'd be marching along. I'll call your girlfriend when I get home, you know, and they didn't like that at all. They thought that was horrible. And then from there, we, we flew from Great Lakes, Illinois, down, down to uh, Mayport, Florida, which is now known as Jacksonville. And we, and we picked up our very first ship, a destroyer. And we no sooner got there, and they said, get your stuff stowed away, we're leaving. What? What do you mean we're leaving? There's a hurricane coming, and we've got to get this ship around the, the tip of Florida and to Galveston before the hurricane gets here. Man, it was rough. I remember laying there on the deck in the sun, on that hot deck, looking at the, the clouds as I, we were going along there, just trying not to throw up. <laughs> I was pretty good, though. It only took me one day to get my sea legs. Some of the other guys didn't fare quite so well. And do you remember... Do you remember? How much of your life do you remember? See, in that day and time, I was always present at the moment for everything. I, I wasn't distracted by so many other things in my life. I was always there in the moment. So I could remember these things. My life was not so consumed with things of unimportance that I missed out on the things of life. That's what Ecclesiastes is trying to tell us, that, that life is the gift of God. We're told to eat, to drink, and enjoy life because that's what there is. But do we do that? You know, I used to love going out to eat and going to restaurants and, and everything, but you know, nowadays it's not the same. I don't really enjoy it so much. There was a time when you went out with somebody and you would sit there at the table and you would communicate with them, you would talk to them, you would have conversation and all that kind of stuff. And nowadays you, you go out to eat and, gosh, everybody's like this? Huh? Am I so disinteresting that you have to resort to social media at dinner? So many people are caught up in trying to figure out what everybody else is doing that is of little importance. And therefore, you see, we miss out on that moment. We miss out on, on the, the truly important things of life. Surely you remember that when computers first came out, I think most of you in here are probably old enough to remember when, when uh, the first computers came out. Andy, do you remember? No? Yeah, I was going to say, you're probably the only one young enough for that, not to remember, but 
Yeah. What were they supposed to do? Oh, yeah, you can. You remember these years, didn't you? Yes. No? Oh, you don't remember the first computers? Oh, yeah, that would be true. <laughs> I had a computer long before that, so. <laughs> Watch the movie, you got mail, you know what that is, right? We, we ran a hundred foot uh, basement cable from my dad's desktop to the living room. We left our house in my bedroom underneath my door in the middle of the night to play Xbox online for the first time. Sweet. And my dad's cable was like, the world is this, and ripped it out. hundred foot Ethernet cable broke from his dad's computer into his bedroom so they could play Xbox at night without dad knowing what he found out. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, what were computers supposed to do? What was the reason for them, though? They were supposed to make life easier. Yes. Right? We're going to have more free time. We're going to have more time off because of computers. How'd that work out for you? Not at all, right? Yeah, I don't know what happened there, but our lives became more and more plugged in, and we became more and more uh, invested in these computers we spend all of our time on. Computers used to do for us uh, uh, great things, but now it, it, they really in, uh, eat up so much of our time. I mean, look at all the time you spend answering emails, or reading them, or deleting them. Hmm? You guys have ever get emails that you don't want? Huh? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. How much time of your life do you think you spend doing just emails? Now, don't send me an email. Call me. I don't check my email that often. Call me. I'll answer the phone if I have your phone number. Or leave a message. I'll call you back. But emails, people spend so much time doing email. There's an article written by Amy, Amy Gallo. And notice this, this is in 2012. She wrote, complaints about email abound. Perhaps you've heard some of, the, uh, some of them uttered or them in, in pain yourself. Uh, I receive hundreds of emails a day. I can spend my whole day responding to incoming messages. I can't find anything, though, in my inbox. Anybody have a problem finding things in your inbox? I mean, if you don't, if you don't hit it right now, you'll never find it again, probably. You get so many emails of you just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And, you know, at least I flag mine and I think it's important so I can look for that little red flag on the side. She goes on to say, in response, some companies are taking drastic steps to help co-workers manage the number of messages they receive. The CEO at um, Addis, a French IT company, has vowed to ban email by 2013. And Volkswagen has said they will stop sending emails to certain employees after hours. Now, these companies are taking such radical action what do you think you should do if you feel overloaded? Actually, experts, uh, productivity experts, uh, though, counsel against such extreme measures. Email is certainly a threat to efficiency, says David Allen, a consultant, and the author of uh, Getting Things Done and Making It All Work. But he maintains that it's also an essential work tool. He said, I've had email since 1983. He said, I couldn't live the life I live without it. And Bob Posen, a senior lecturer of uh, business administration at Carver Business School, he's the author of Extreme Productivity Agrees. Even if you wanted to use it less, he says, it's probably impossible to get a hold of people by telephone. How many of you call people and hope that they, they won't answer you? Hmm? Yeah, we call our kids, they won't answer the phone. But I can text them and they'll text me back. What's wrong with that picture, right? Huh? Yeah. I mean, but, but the truth is that you can't get a hold of anybody by phone anymore. And he says that uh, both uh, Posen and Allen believe that the sweeping rules like that at uh, Atis and uh, B, uh, BW uh, really are not necessary. When people get mired down in the backlog, it leads them to even more emails and more meetings from frustrated coworkers. He says, if you will answer your emails, 
then you will get less emails. Okay? If you're efficient in your meetings, you'll have less meetings. He said one client had a backlog of an average of three to 4,000 emails. Can you imagine? Three to 4,000 emails. And he finally cleared and stayed on top of his inbox. Both his email traffic and his meeting uh, load went down. He kept getting more and more emails because his colleagues couldn't ever get a hold of him to make a decision so that they would know what to do and all that kind of stuff. So it was constantly one email after another that he wasn't answering. And when he finally got on top of it, they quit emailing him and they quit needing to have more meetings because they weren't getting anything done. And I think that makes sense for all of us. Taking the time to reply uh, now can save twice as much time in the future. And that's not even counting about all the emails we get that we didn't even ask for. You guys get all kinds of offers in, on email to buy this, buy that, do this, do that, all that kind of stuff. I mean, once you get on one mailing list, uh, it doesn't end, does it? Stop. Go to the bottom. Hit unsubscribe. Get rid of them. That way you can limit how much you have to go through. And if you think emails are bad, about social media. Hmm? How much time do you think the average person spends on social media? You might want to venture a guess. An hour a day? Two hours a day? Probably eight hours. That's quite a wide range. According to uh, Statista, uh, 20, in 2017, which is the most re recent year we have full data for, People spend an average of 135 minutes a day or nearly two and a half hours a day on social media. Now that's an average. When you consider people like me, I don't even have social media on my phone. In fact, Whitney put social media on my phone and I took it back off. I, I don't want Facebook on my phone. I don't want that stuff at all. I, I, I look at it once in a great while on the computer, but I don't spend much time on it. So when you consider it, there are people like me who don't do social media really, how much time do you think the average person who does do it really does it? Because there's a lot of people that don't do social media. And that's up from 2016 where the average was 126 minutes a day, <coughs> two hours a day on social media. Ecclesiastes tells us that we're supposed to be present in the moment and enjoy it. Are we? Are we present in the moment when things are going on in our lives? Are we present in the moment when, when we're talking to people? Are we present in the moment when we're out to eat? Are we present in the moment so that we can enjoy what's going on around us? How many did you remember five years ago? Three years ago, two years ago, a year ago. You see, the problem is, is we don't remember because we're not truly there. All this stuff just happens because we're not really thinking about it at the time. You can remember your childhood probably because you were there. You weren't so distracted. And even maybe that younger generation is going away with all the stuff that takes precedence in their lives. What do you need to change in your life? That's the question today that you might be present in the moment. That is the gift.